Well, I would like to welcome each one of you one more time to this series of life and ministry of Jesus Christ, where we are learning the life of Christ, where we are learning the mind of Christ. We are learning how, how did Christ perform his ministry and how was Christ's motives when he was doing his ministry. So his life and his teaching is a great challenge for each one of us to learn from Christ, to live like Christ. Ultimately, for all Christians, this is one important motive of our life, and that is to know Christ and to be like Christ. So in this course, that is what exactly we are learning. Now we are going through parables of Jesus Christ, and today it will be part three. So what are we learning in parables of Jesus Christ? Through parables, Jesus is unveiling the truths of heaven, unveiling the truths of spiritual life, unveiling the Christian values. What is actually Christian values? So while Jesus was teaching this, his ultimate aim was to understand what exactly Christ wants us to do and to know what Christ values. So in this third part of uh, parables of Jesus Christ, we are going to learn what Jesus values in our Christian life. Last time we finished with the wealth of this world, where Jesus says we should learn from the people of this world how they manage their wealth. They know that they will no longer have that wealth or that position or that kind of life, they manage their wealth well so that they will be rewarded later. In the same way, now Christ says you need and I need to learn from these people that this wealth that is mammon, the wealth of unrighteous, this wealth is something that God has given us in this world so that we can use it wisely because one day this wealth will fail and even we have to leave this earth and there is a heavenly dwelling. So store up the things in heaven so that these wealth can be converted into heavenly dwelling assets. So as Christians, we are taught to learn from the people of this world how to use this wealth wisely. Since this wealth will not go with us, it is not going to be a heavy gain in the world to come. Store up the things in heaven. That is where exactly we close to it. Now, today, as we go on to our next episode, let's look what is new for us today. Luke chapter 16, verse 14 and 15 says, Now Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourself in the sight of men. But God knows your heart for that which is highly esteemed among men is distasteable in the sight of God. This is a very important teaching in Christian life and Christian ministry. What do exactly Jesus was saying here? Exactly what Jesus was saying is that, now the fact, so Jesus is putting the context together. Pharisees who were lovers of money. This word has to be highlighted very well. Lovers of money. So the subject is Pharisees who were the lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. Because for them, what Jesus was saying was of no value because they loved money. And Jesus was always talking about money as a wealth of unrighteousness or mammon. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourself in the sight of men. You are those who justify yourself in the sight of men, but God knows your heart. So that which is highly esteemed among men is distasteable. This is another word, distasteable in the sight of God. That means what is highly honored in the eyes of men are distasteable in the sight of God. One thing I would like to just stop for a minute here 
and would like to remind you one important thing. As Jesus was talking about money, he didn't say money is bad. Jesus never spoke about money is bad. But Jesus said love towards money was always unpleasant in the sight of God. See, even money was used by Jesus. And we know how Jesus had to pay taxes. And he said, no, give what is, to, what is of Caesar, give to Caesar. So money was something that was needed, right? Jesus had someone in his team who carried money or someone who, who kept money. So money is not rooted or stated as something bad, but the love towards money is always seen as bad in Bible. You know, you will see, if you go from Genesis to Revelation, you will see people, robbers, they have repented. We can see people who are backsliders have come back to the Lord. We have seen murderers coming back to the Lord. We have seen, uh, uh, we have seen adulterous people, you know, who were, if who were fallen in adultery, they have come back to the Lord. But you might not see someone who had the love of money have ever come to the kingdom of God. Someone who had this love of money, unless and until this person take that love of money out, this person would never fit in the kingdom of God. You can see with anybody in Bible who loved money. You know about Balaam. What happened with Balaam? He loved money. You know what happened with uh, Gehazi? He loved money. And what was the end of Gehazi? What was the end of Balaam? You know how in, in New Testament, somebody came and asked Jesus, I want to follow you. You know, what? how can I inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus said, you know, go and sell everything. And this guy was very sad because he was pretty rich. So in Bible, you will see every kind of sinners have come back to the Lord. They have repented and they came back to the Lord. But somebody who had love towards money, we have not seen them repenting and coming back to Lord. You know, Judas was one example, classic example in the team of Jesus who loved money. And for the sake of money, he even sold Jesus Christ. But what happened? The end was so miserable. But, you know, you call with anybody. Now, unless and until someone really repent from the love of money, they cannot be in the kingdom of God. So if you see someone like, for example, if you see Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus had love of money. He, he made money, but the way he repented was he gave back everything, not just gave back, but he gave four times back from what they have, what he received unlawfully. So a true repentance Unless a true repentance comes, there won't, you won't see people being used in the hands of God. You have seen in the example of Paul, you know, when Paul and even disciples, there were a lot of people who, who loved money. There was one, one family, Ananias and Sapphira. What they did, they, because of the love of money, they, they lied to Holy Spirit. And the end was miserable. So there are people who followed Jesus with the love of money and they could not make it. What I'm saying is that with love of money, nobody can make it to that kingdom. But if somebody repents, and that's only one way that if you repent, you can see that God can transform you. So friends, I want to tell you in Christian life, money, as, as, as always we say, money is a good slave, but a bad master. Let money never rule over us. Let money never rule over us. If we keep pride because we have money, or if we are so prideful about our riches, then friends, we have the love of money. So money should not control us. Rather, we should control money. You know, and if, if, you, if you are here today as a student of Bible, if you're learning theology, let me tell you, in these days, the more of percentage that you will see in Christian ministry are people who are money lovers. They will make projects to love to because of the love of money. They will make business out of ministry. They will make business out of everything. So friends, 
when you see your pastor when you see some any other pastor who is more concerned about your money than your life then remember this person is a lover of money never invest money or give money to a lover of money your money will be in waste so always remember in christian life love people than loving money you know when we make friendship with someone why do we make friendship with someone if you or someone if you are wealthy person and if you have money and 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 a kind of minister or some kind of missionary and some kind of people if they are making you as friend they have a pretended idea behind making you as a friend and their idea is to get your money into their pocket friends understand that you know the the love towards people should not be based on money in churches or in ministry we are not we should not be loving people based on money because christ loved everybody and we ought to love everybody so love of money is the worst thing i'm sorry to say that most of the missionaries that you see around us most of the so called ministers most of the great preachers look into their profiles if if they are behind your money do not send them money your money is in waste rather send to some deserving people who are in need of money so love of money is a bad thing now as a believer if you are working you know you may be working in any kind of field you may be working in it field you may be working in medical field making money is nothing wrong no there is nothing wrong in making money if you are smart you can make money but do not allow money to rule over you <coughs> going to 16 16 the law and the prophets were proclaimed until john since that time gospel of kingdom gospel of the kingdom of god has been preached and everyone is forcing his way into it now listen talking about this money to pharisees now the second point jesus say the law and prophets were proclaimed until john since that time the gospel of kingdom of god has been preached and everyone is forcing his way into it there is a slight difference here from 16 1 to 18 and 16 19 till 31 what are the differences here see 16 1 to 18 you can see a parable of unjust steward but here you can see from 19 to 31 a parable of rich man and lazarus you know the story very well so i'm not explaining the story very well i'm just steward we know how he maintained his money right and here rich man and uh, a poor lazarus and you know the story both of them lived but this rich man lived in his riches lazarus was so poor he had to be you know Uh, under the mercy of this rich man to get even food so it is written that dogs would come and they would they would they would come and lick on the sores of lazarus and one day both lazarus and rich man died lazarus was carried to abraham's bosom and then rich man ended up in hell fire so now rich man says you know he saw this lazarus on abraham's bosom and cried out cries out and says that oh would you allow lazarus to just dip his last small finger pinky finger and just give me a drop of water on my tongue and then uh, the answer comes that between you and him there is a huge shield there is a huge gap no one would come from that side to this side and from this side to that side and then finally he said okay if that's the case let me ask you something can i ask to you to send someone or send lazarus to the people back in my country or in my village so that he can go and tell what is happening here and then the answer comes in they have their prophets and moses and all those law books there if they do not agree or believe in those prophets and law books they are not going to agree or believe someone who even comes alive and go and tell them so these two stories are something very unique in its nature you know i will tell you something when 
there are people who says this is just a story and parable we should not be making meaning out of it but jesus was telling something very deep with the parable of rich man and lazarus you know for a minute just i would like to go into a glance of that what was that parable so one of the thing is that most of the scholars says the name lazarus you know in in all the parables of jesus jesus never used names so in this parable he used a name and this is the only parable where jesus used a name i will say this that could be something to catch up with reality this is the only parable with jesus used name that means it's not just a parable but this is a reality too so jesus is telling jesus is telling us that death is for sure for both poor and for rich and then jesus is telling both of them will find their destination and another thing what jesus is telling is that once you die then you cannot change your destination you will go to the destined part someone who goes to hell fire and someone who goes to abraham's bosom which is also known as paradise okay a resting place and someone is going to the tormenting place so rich man ended up in a tormenting place where lazarus end up in paradise or resting place one thing what jesus was telling through this parable was it is not possible to transfer from one place to another place you know there is a there is, there, there used to be and there is still a belief among few churches mainline churches i don't want to name their churches because it's it's a class study i don't want to name that church but there are few mainline churches who believe that no matter a person dies how no matter how he dies whether he was a sinner or a saint or whatever he was after death there are three important days for three days continuously prayer and supplication can change the fate of this person who died if this person was about to go to hell through prayers and through givings and this money supplies this person's fate can be changed from hell to heaven and there is one more thing that they believe that after within 40 days if you have continuously prayer for 40 days give money and food to poor people this person who was supposed to go to hell can be transferred to heaven that is the reason why a famous saying is there the coin in the coffin rings the soul in the purgatory springs they believe that every soul will go to purgatory and when the coin rings that means when you put some money into purgatory that soul will jump into heaven friends there is nothing like that if any churches teach you that that is not biblical in bible nobody have ever taught this by in bible it is very clear when you are absent in body you find your destination either you are in christ or you are in the place of tormentation friends and and the thing what here that we need to understand is that through after death no matter what your family does no matter how your relatives do no matter how good funeral service you get no matter how great home going service you get your fate is not going to change today we need to understand this very well very well some people believe oh just because he didn't get a good even a good funeral service or she didn't get even a good funeral service so just because you get a good funeral service your soul will not go to heaven you know unfortunately most of the lies are being spoken during the funeral service i'm i'm telling you the truth i'm been seeing funeral service and attending funeral service most of the lies are been told in the funeral service and home going service you know this person was great and this person was doing and that and this and this and whole time you might have always when this person was alive you said all the negative things against this person when this person is dead dead and now you get your microphone and we all come with no good things here so friends i want to tell you something that we need to live in a way like when we leave our body we need to be with the lord so parable of rich man and lazarus is very clear we make our destination right after our death there is no more they, you cannot alter that destination after you breathe the last breath if you are there and if you understand this say amen
And if there was somebody who think that, you know, at the last minute, I can change my fate. Oh, the after my death, my parents, my relatives, my people, my church would do a great grand funeral service and they will do some spells and spells, put some money in there and my spirit will be in heaven. That will never happen. So today, I want to tell you there is only one life. And after this one life, there is death for everybody. We all have to die. Prepare ourselves to die like a saint in Jesus Christ. To die in the Lord is gain. That's why Paul says to die in the Lord is gain. COVID is taking a good toll on each one of us, right? There are so many other things yet to come. So friends, I want to tell you, do not be afraid of death. Rather face death with Christ. Because the one who have uh, redeemed you is able to take care of you. Can I get a good amen here? And somebody who believed that, yes, I believe that I will be with the Lord and I will be with the Lord in, in all the things that I do, I will be with the Lord. Amen? All right. So now keeping these two parallel, and one more thing I want to tell you. Oh, one more thing I want to tell you. You know, there are some people who believe and, I, and, and, and this was many times asked to me, even from families and even from brothers and sisters to me, you know, why don't Christ do some miracle in our church? If Lord will do some miracle in our church, uh, with this miracle, many people will come to Christ. You know, if Lord do, uh, if Lord can just, you know, raise a, somebody from dead in my church, many people will come to Jesus Christ. Many people will believe in Christ. This is one thing we think. We think that through miracles, people can believe in Jesus Christ. And here is what in this parable, Jesus is making it very clear. When this rich man asked, would you send Lazarus? to my relatives, to my friends, to my brothers. I have five more brothers. I don't want them to come here. Now, this, this rich man was actually good in heart. See, he was good in heart. He never wanted his brothers to come where he was. Rather, many times we will think, oh, let everybody come where I am. I am already messed up. Let everybody else come to me, right? But this guy was so good. He said, no, nobody should come to me. And so he said, would you send Lazarus? If Lazarus goes and testify a new testimony, I was dead. I went to Sheol. I went to purgatory. I went to Abraham's bosom and came back with all these testimonies. People will believe in Christ. He said, my brothers will believe in the words of Lazarus. But then the, uh, the answer from heaven was this. We have prophets and Moses and the books over there, right? We have prophets, books, everything. Moses, everything is there. If they don't believe that, they, will, they won't even believe Lazarus. So this is one thing I want to tell you, friends. It is not because of miracles. It's not because of great miracles that people believe in Jesus Christ. If they cannot believe the word of God, if they cannot believe apostles, if they cannot believe prophets whom God has sent, they are not going to believe any miraculous testimony too. So friends, remember one thing. You know, in Facebook, in most of the medias, you normally see a lot of miracles happening. I was seeing other day, people were thinking about some signs in sky coming like Jesus is coming soon, clouds. It was a photo shop and most of the Christians believe, oh, that was a miracle, Jesus is coming soon. And then there was another, another, another thing that I've seen that there is a Bible somewhere, it, I read in Atlanta, there was a Bible, an open Bible from where oil comes out, oil comes out. Every year, tons of oils comes out from this Bible. And people go and visit this place and definitely this Bible is dipped in oil and people think, Nobody can see oil increasing over there in a day. It takes years to see a, a, a little bit of oil there. We don't know who put oils in there, but there are people who think, do you think God who said, I don't want to make them to believe in resurrection, to believe in eternal life by sending Lazarus, would this God allow this unjust miracles to happen just to make people to trust in God. Friends, I want to tell you, people, we are not supposed to trust this Lord just because of only miracles, but we need to trust this God 
who came to this earth, died for us on the cross of Calvary, and God resurrected, and today he is alive. We believe it because of the testimony and the gospel that was preached to us. You know, 2,000 years ago, if this gospel was preached in only Palestine, and these disciples took this gospel to the corners of the world, and we all have believed, and now a good pop, a good majority of people on this planet, on this planet Earth, believe in Jesus Christ was not just because of the miracles that they have seen, but because of the gospel that has been preached, and that's why Bible says preaching the gospel is the most powerful thing. Preaching the gospel, or definitely God will do miracles. I do believe God do, God does miracles. But remember, people are not going to believe in Jesus just because of miracles, but because of the word of God, because word has its own power. And this word, by believing this word, will, you know, that will that will make in that will convert the word into miracle. So, friends, I want to ask you today: if you are waiting for a miracle that to happen and to believe in God, I will tell you. Do not wait for a miracle. Rather say, Lord, I believe you. Whether miracles happens or not, I believe in you. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What he said, what they said was this. I, we know God can save us from this fire. But even if he won't go and save us, we still believe in God. How many of you today can say, yes, I love miracle. Yes, I want to see miracle. But then I don't believe in God just because of miracle. I believe in the Lord because of the word of God that was spoken into my life. Friends, this word of God can bring changes to your life. Can I get a good amen? And those who testify this, yes, the word of God is powerful. Word of God has transformed me. Miracles are not going to transform you, but word of God is going to transform you. Miracles are not going to make your spiritual life super spiritual life, but word is going to make your life super spiritual life. Amen. Can, can somebody put some glorious testimony into this and say that, amen, I believe in the word of God. You know, friends, I want to tell you, when I was, well, when I was small, I've seen miracles in my life. I've seen miracles in my life. As I, I think in one of my testimony, I told that I lost my eyesight. For three years, I lost my eyesight. And after three years, God opened my eyesight. It was 100% open. There were times where my radio alna was broken. And in just few minutes, this Lord has, you know, joined this radio alna within just few minutes. I've seen this miracle. But these miracles are not the one that transformed me. The transformation that happened was through the word of God. So friends, let me tell you, if you are waiting for a miracle, I have waited for a miracle. But more than a miracle, believe the word and miracle will follow you. Amen. And Lord is able to take care of everything. So just trust this Lord and believe in the Lord. You know, pray for a miracle. That's perfectly fine. Our Lord is still in the business of miracle. That is perfectly fine. But do not just depend upon this one thing. If Lord performs a miracle, then I will believe. No, we have never seen people being transformed or being redeemed or being saved who said, I want to see a miracle, then I will believe in Lord. You know, that is not how Lord saves. Believe in the word of God. Believe in the testimony of the Lord in itself and miracles will follow you. Can I get a good amen if you believe that? I, I When I'm speaking this, I'm speaking to some people who are waiting for miracles, you know, for transformation. Transformation will never happen with miracles. Transformation happens with the word of God. Now, in this, both of these parables let's look into this pharisees who were the lovers of money wherever whereas in the parable of rich man of lazarus rich man was a lover of money right so we can see both ways lovers of money the pharisee who were lovers of money and rich man who was a lover of money but what happened pharisees had laws and prophets where law and prophets were proclaimed until john so you know john the baptist came in and he was in the line, the last prophet to be sent in Old Testament. Even though you see John the Baptist in New Testament, but John the Baptist is counted as Old Testament prophet, not as a New Testament prophet. New Testament begins with the teaching of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So these Pharisees were told, the Pharisees were told, 
You know, you have laws and prophets. They had laws and prophets until the time of John. It was proclaimed. But these Pharisees never believed in laws and prophets. Rather, they were lovers of money. In rich man's case, what happened? Rich man's case, if they, it was asked that, you know, would you please send Lazarus and the, and the voice came in. If they do not believe or listen to Moses, and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Simple thing. A common denominator for both the Old Testament and New Testament is this. Believe the word written by prophets, apostles. And if we cannot believe that, miracles are not going to change your life. Miracles are not going to save you. Miracles are not going to give you a future. Miracles will follow. That will follow the word. Everyone who believed in the word can see miracles. But miracles by itself cannot stand alone. Word of God is more important. What is most important for Pharisees here? Bible says, laws and prophets were proclaimed until John. Listen to them. Here, Moses and prophets, they all were talking. If you have not heard the word of God, you know, there are people who say that, you know, I know Bible. I read all 66 books of Bible. Now, I know everything, but God has to talk to me. Now, I have seen people who have asked me, okay, if I want to receive water baptism, God should come and talk to me. Well, God already talked and said about water baptism in the word. If you cannot believe the word of God for water baptism, he is not going to come and compel you in your vision or in your dream, go and take water baptism. Well, somebody says, yeah, salvation, I know Bible, it's all things are written about salvation. But when God will come, Jesus will come and talk to me personally about salvation, then I will receive Jesus Christ as personal savior. Friends, Normally, that never happens because by this, this principle you have to take. If you do not listen Moses and prophets, you can add apostles to here because they are also in the lines of prophets, okay? You will not be persuaded even someone after death would come and tell you. So if you are waiting for that one personal talk, you know, there are people, you cannot override the word of God over you cannot override the word of god for young people people believe right you know lord talk to me show me the partner we we talk about partners and then they say lord have shown me a partner for example if you are at the age of marriage and and if parents you're listening this and pastors you're listening this you can always use this in your church and if you have used this that's perfectly fine you know young people when they look for partners always if they come and tell me, the Lord showed me a girl or Lord showed me a guy uh, and, and Lord have asked me to go and marry this person and this person is not in faith. I should go and marry and bring this person in faith. That is absolutely wrong. God will not override the word of God. Bible is very clear. Do not get yoked with unbelievers. Bible is very clear about a marriage between a believer and a believer. Marriage is not between a believer and a non-believer. All right. And God who said your marriage should be between believers or do not get, you know, unequally yoked with unbelievers. This God will never tell you go and marry someone who is not a believer. So friends, remember when you feel like, you know, you, Many, many times what happens is that you feel something good and you think that that feeling is from God. God would never give you a feeling against the word of God. God will never give you an inspiration that is against the word of God. You know, take any case in Bible. In your dream, you may see something in your heart. You may, you may get you know, attracted to someone. You may feel like to do something else. I want to tell you that never happens. Your feeling is not the feeling of God. That is your infatuation. That is your feeling. That is never God's feeling. Remember, God's feelings are given in the word of God. Can I get a good amen if you believe that? Right? See, God's, in, in God's word says, 
you have only one God and there is no other God. And after that, if you go and believe in something else and believing that this is also a truth, then that is not the word of God. That is your feeling. You know, I do. I, I, you might have heard about someone coming and talking about universalism, saying that, you know, ultimately everybody is going to be saved. No matter if you're a Christian, Hindu, Muslim, a Jew, or whoever you are, no matter how you live, Christ's finished work is going to redeem everybody. And finally, we all are going to be saved. Bible never talks about it. Only people who believe will be saved. Believe and you will be saved. People who do not believe will perish. So people who die without the Lord will finish. So remember this thing. Do not rely upon your feeling and, and don't, don't lie to yourself. God is speaking to me. Friends, today most of the Christians have failed here. Most of the Christians have failed here with this feeling. You know, with this feeling, they feel like, oh, I feel God is talking to me. And what you feel is something against the word of God that cannot be feeling from God. God makes you to feel in line with Bible, in line with word of God. Anything that does not line with word of God is not God's feeling. Write it down in your diary. Write it down in your mind. So if somebody comes and gives you a prophecy that does not align with the word of God, simple thing, simple thing. God never intended you to become rich in the world. God intended you to be rich in heaven, right? Any prophecy that comes to you talks about your wealth, talks about the wealth of this world, talks about the prosperity of this world is not from God because God's intention in Bible is not to make you filthy rich in this world, but his intention is to make you rich in heavenly places. So friends, if you hear a prophecy based on the wealth of this world, then you need to evaluate these prophecies are not from God. God is not going to tell you the numbers of, of your lucky draw. There are people who use prophecy for lucky draw. God will never tell you the numbers of lucky draw. God will never tell you the stock market prices. God is not going to tell you the, the, in, the, the market situation, crisis kind of things are coming in. But God can always guide you to lead a successful and victorious Christian life. That is where the true prophecies come. I know many people will not like it, but this is what the truth is. So if tomorrow I come and give you a prophecy about wealth, if I come and give you a prophecy, your bank is going to be flooded with money. I want to tell you, you should discern me that I am not speaking from the word of God. I am, speak, I am speaking from the love of money. So friends, remember, if anybody comes to you and gives you the word of God with prosperity, you know, feel good messages are not the messages from God. Always remember, Feel good messages are not the messages from God. God will convince you about your sin every time. God will convince you your lackings every time. God will convince you your weakness every time. Not to destroy you, but to build you into a better thing. And those who believe that say amen. And let that amen be an amen for everybody in this life. So, this money matter was very important. And then the next thing he goes with in chapter 17, verse one and two. After speaking about money that Jesus takes about, he said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a milestone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Remember, saying it is inevitable. That means it is for truth. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. That means there are two meanings in this. Number one is the meaning that someone who is about to stop the work of God, 
someone will come someone will come a stumbling block will come and it it has to come and uh, it was also jesus so there are scholars who believe that this was also said about the death of jesus that somebody would come or would be in the plan of a plan where this person will deceive jesus christ they said it would be better for him if a milestone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble that means this is one important thing one important teaching friends and this is where preachers and teachers will be accounted by lord see it is inevitable that means satan is is a reality enemy is a reality as a stumbling block will come and deceive people cause a lot of people to stumble and there are people who will be used for that so remember for any good cause there are people whom whom satan have used to 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 make or to cause stumbling blocks bible says and jesus said it would be better if a millstone was hung around his neck if a millstone if a hard stone a milestone like big milestone or even millstone would hung around his neck and he would throw this big with the rock he will throw into the sea that he would cause no, no cause one of these little ones to stumble that much god hates people who cause stumbling blocks what is the importance of this thing in church remember church always remember that through your action through my action through your word and my word there should not be a single person around us in our community in our family who will fall from faith remember this there are so many people in our church who are weak believers who may be strong believers and weak believers in our family who are weak believers do not do anything do not say anything that will cause this weak believers to stumble and to reject the lord god says the word of god says it is better for him to die being drowned in water friends in our christian life through our actions through our writings through our teachings let no one fall far from the faith you know there were so many pastors who were once great preachers great teachers but today because of their lifestyle because of their new teachings because of their you know uh, new philosophies they have caused so many people to reject this precious faith and go back to their own religiosities to go back to have this downfall in faith there are so many people around us paul understood this one time and he said this you know what i have taught you the pure gospel and if anybody who talks against this pure gospel and pure teachings even if that would be an angel from heaven or even i the person is cursed cursed is the person who would do that so friends remember in these days there will be hundreds and thousands of teachers who would come and would talk things back against your faith do not fall from faith and you better do not aggravate those people or you better take care of your life and your faith do not fall into that pitfalls all right so make sure we all take care of this so in this study actually we have to take care of our personal life also the life of others so in christian life this is very important it is inevitable this is for true that stumbling blocks would come but i wish that they would be you know it would have been better that they would have drowned in water not cause anybody to stumble be on your guard one important thing be on your guard what do you mean by be on your guard if your brother sins rebuke him if he repents forgive him and if he sins against you seven times a day 
and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Very important Christian teaching here. What do you mean by that? So be on your guard. This is for your guard. What is that? If your brother sins, rebuke him. You know, today, rebuking or, you know, corrections is something that is not seen in churches, right? In most of our preachings, we don't use corrections anymore because that is, set, that is called as uh, word abuse, sentence abuse, you know, abuses in preaching. Correct. You cannot correct anybody. If you make a correction message, if you put a correction message, then you are not loved by people, right? People love to hear feel-good messages. Remember, be on your guard. How can I guard myself? Be on your guard. How can I guard myself? This is one important thing. Be on your guard. How can I guard myself? If, you, if your brother sins rebuke him. So when you said this, there is a deeper meaning in this. I will tell you something. I do remember someone who came and told me this. Some, some, it was quite a few years back. Someone called and, and said me this. You know, pastor, why I don't preach? I don't preach because if I preach something and tomorrow if I mess in that same thing that I'm preaching, then everybody who heard will come and question me, right? And that's right. And that's true. I am not preaching. I'm not teaching because if I mess up in the thing that I teach or I preach, others can come and question me. That's why Jesus said, be on your guard. You are preaching. And if you rebuke somebody, if you rebuke somebody, because of sinning through your preaching, through your teaching, or through your, through your friendship, you are guarding yourself not to do the same sin for which you are rebuking. So that is how you guard yourself. Do you see that philosophy? Do you see that teaching of Jesus Christ? You guard yourself. When you preach something, when you preach about holiness, you're guarding yourself for holiness. When you preach against the love of money, you're guarding yourself to love of money. So you know what? When you proclaim it through your word, now you are obliged to perform that in your life. You're obliged to keep that in your life. That's why be on your guide. And remember one thing more. When you rebuke him, if he repents, you need to forgive him. And how many times you need to forgive? Seven times. Somebody asks, you, how many times should I forgive? Seven times 70. That means as long as he repents, forgive. Why? As long as you repent, God forgives you. You might ask, how long will God forgive me? God will forgive as long as you repent. Remember, there is no sin in this world that God will not forgive except the sin against Holy Spirit. The word of God says, which I will talk to you sometime later. I'm not going to explain it today. But rest of all the sins. So for, you know, just to, just to clarify, because you might cause this doubt forever. Why did Jesus said the sin against Holy Spirit will not be forgiven? When you reject Jesus Christ from your life, that is sinning against Holy Spirit completely rejecting Christ and the faith in Christ. You are rejecting Holy Spirit. You're causing Holy Spirit to, 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 uh, you know, to, be, to be in a place where Holy Spirit is not very really happy about you. That is a sin against Holy Spirit. Okay. And there are a few more things which we will talk about it later, but just for a glance. But otherwise, any sin that you commit, if you repent and if I repent, God is there to forgive us. There are people who still don't believe, especially, you know, when we are born and raised in Eastern religious background, East, we all come from East, right? Most of us come from East. In Eastern religious background, uh, where we have heard about, you know, life of hermits, sages, saints, they all have a life of sacrifice. So being in the history of that life of sacrifice, we always feel that we have to, you know, put our body down. We have to sacrifice our body. We have to sacrifice everything to lead a saintly life. More than that, 
Bible gives an open arm invitation to everybody. No matter how you have messed up, you can come back, you can repent and Lord will forgive you. The beauty of Christian gospel is this, which is not found in any other religion. Every religion has a condition to get saved. Every religion has a condition you know, for, for forgiveness. This is the only teaching in the world which Jesus has taught. There is no condition for forgiveness. If we repent and come to Lord, seven times 70, he is ready to embrace us. He is ready to forgive. But ultimately we have to come. We have to come with a heart of repentance. That This is the beauty of this Christian truth, a Christian gospel. How many of you are blessed to have a Lord who will forgive you every time you go and cry? You know, there are people who live in guilt. Still, there are people who live in guilt. God cannot forgive that. My God, oh, God cannot forgive that. I will definitely have to repay that. Friends, remember one thing. Every sin that we commit, God will forgive. But if you think that way, there is a discipline for everything. There is a discipline, okay? Discipline will be there, but forgiveness is 100%. Forgiveness is 100%. For example, for example, just for example, Bible says you should not steal. You should not steal. And being a believer, you stole something from somewhere, okay? You did one time, you repented. God said, okay, I forgive you. If you do the second time, and you want to repent, maybe that time you will repent and God will forgive, but you will be caught. You know, there are people who are caught in adultery, right? Remember, people who were caught in adultery, that was not the first time they were caught in adultery. Adultery might have happened several times in their mind, in their heart, in their, in their, in their mental mind, and even physically they might have done that. But God forgave them. But what happened when they did not learn this lesson with one forgiveness, they go and do it again and again, then God will expose them to other people. Then this person will get caught red-handed in adultery or in stealing or in something else. Will God forgive them? Yes, God might forgive them. But you have to live with this discipline of being caught with the shame, with the reward, and with the shame, and with all those punishment, guilt, you have to live with the whole life. But would God forgive you? Yes, God can forgive you. But remember, world will not forgive you. Wherever you will go, you will find people talking about you about that. You know, and that is the discipline. That is the discipline. Because when God gave you chance, you never discipline yourself. Friends, remember one thing. You, as a believer, if you are doing something wrong, you will not be caught in first time. Nobody will notice that. First time, it will be secret. Second time, it can be secret. But third time, some common friends will know that. And even God will give you some time to repent there. And when you don't repent there, then slowly society will come to know about that. Then you will repent to God. But remember, by that time, you already messed up. You have to live with the shame. That is the punishment. But did God forgive you? Yes, God might forgive you. If you have repented truly, God might forgive you. So friends, remember one thing. Forgiveness from God, you will get it if we repent. But remember, when you continuously sin on the same thing, Hebrews say it, says it well. If you deliberately commit sin, if you deliberately commit sin, then there is no more sacrifice for you. That means when you deliberately commit sin, you have not repented. Once you repent, you will not commit that sin. So that is the Christian, Christian teaching. So will God forgive? Yes, God will forgive when you repent. But repentance doesn't mean that you will commit the same sin again and again and you ask forgiveness and that becomes a license for you. Never. Paul says, is that that is grace is not a license. Grace is not a license. So remember, grace has given to us so that we might not fall. So everybody who believe in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, would you say amen to this? How many of you believe your sins are forgiven? And if your sins are being, if you, if you have been haunted by sins and haunted by guilt, today I want to tell you, if the haunting thing is not from God, 
your if satan is bringing you the old bad memories that you committed sin in your youth you committed some sins in your young age you committed some mistake and after repenting if enemy is bringing that back into your memory today i want to tell you that this is a deceiving spirit who want to put back into guilt he want to put you back into guilt and would this spirit want you to doubt the forgiveness of god today come out of this today come out of this can i get a good amen if there is somebody who is going through this pain if somebody is going through this pain that something is coming back to your memory those old memories old sins are coming back to you even after repentance that is not from holy spirit that is from evil spirit you need to come out of this today today you have to just cast that spirit out in the name of jesus and say that i do not doubt in the forgiveness of god i am forgiven it is finished i believe in the finished work of jesus christ you have to tell this to your mind so through this teaching we, are, we there is an inner healing that should happen there is an inner healing that should happen because you know what i will tell you this i have seen people and i have counseled people at their old age in old age when they actually become a little weak they cannot pray and they cannot read bible this doubt will haunt them oh at the age of 16 at the age of 20 at the age of 28 you committed sin you did that you did this and this old person will go back into that young age of age of 28 and 29 that they committed sin for which god has already forgiven but enemy will bring cast doubt into that you know why the whole life they did not dealt with this doubt today if you follow this word deal with your doubts cast your doubt away say that i am redeemed by the precious blood of jesus christ and bible says as far as east is from the west that is how jesus has taken away my sins how many of you believe my sins are forgiven it's taken away just you know when you type it into your notes when you put that into your comment you are agreeing with the word and you are saying that yes lord i believe in the forgiveness of lord no past memory can haunt me so be of good god rebuke the sin so that you know this person will repent and when this person repents you will forgive and make sure as you forgive your sins are forgiven in heavenly places the apostle says to the lord in now here is what the most important thing okay here is the most important thing the apostle said to the lord increase our faith And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. You know, what was the verse before this? Be on guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Uh, if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day, return to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. So the apostle said, oh man, how can I forgive? You know, it is very hard for me to forgive someone seven times a day. So apostle said, Lord, do one thing, increase our faith so that we can forgive. So apostles are saying, if we need to forgive, please increase. I don't have that much faith to forgive somebody. Say that increase my faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey. That means your faith has such a great power that a mulberry tree, that means a tree with a fibrous root, a tree with large roots, if even that rooted tree would be uprooted and be planted in the sea, what does that mean? What does that mean? Many people take this literally. I have learned and heard preachers preaching it literally that if you have faith, you command a tree, it will be uprooted and will be somewhere else. It's not that. Jesus was talking this in a parallelism, like how the sin, if somebody is committing sin, and when you ask them to rebuke, rebuke them and repent, the sin will be forgiven. That means the sin that is rooted so wide in the heart of a person. By faith, if you command this 
sin would be uprooted and will go down into the sea where you will not see this tree anymore. Mulberry tree that was so tough on the ground. By faith, just how the sin will go is like how the mulberry tree will be uprooted from this place and will go drown in the sea. And the tree will not be even seen. A sweet comparison of how sin was rooted in my body, in my heart, and this sin was taken away, and this sin, this sin was uprooted, and this sin that was uprooted is being now drowned in a sea that you cannot even see this sin. Friends, do you understand what I say? Today, believe that by faith, when you actually repent, by faith, when you repent, no matter how big is your sin, no matter how deep is your sin, no matter how, how, how deep and how, how strong that sinful root is, it will be uprooted and it will no more be visible because it will be taken under the sea. Can somebody say amen to this, amen to this? That's why Apostle said, increase our faith, O Lord, by faith. So by faith, you can uproot every strongholds of sin. Do you hear me today? So students of theology, we are not just learning the word, but we are also putting this into practice. By faith, you can uproot any kind of sin, any kind of addiction, any kind of addiction. If you feel I cannot uproot this today, the word of God is saying by faith, by faith. If you command a mulberry tree, like a, a sinful thing, if you command this addiction, if you command your addiction to, root, to be uprooted, it will be uprooted and it will be planted in the sea that you will never see it again. Today, I want to just give a great believing thought to each one of you. If you believe something is too difficult, I cannot change this. I cannot change my character. I cannot change this addiction. I cannot get out of this. I am telling you in the sight of word of God that you can do it and today is the day. Don't keep it for tomorrow. Right now, when the word of God is being taught, you can believe this and try to practice it today. Like apostle says, Lord, increase our faith your faith will be increased. You need more faith to uproot any kind of addictions, to uproot any kind of sin. See the apostles request in Jesus' response. Give us more faith and then we will be able to forgive as we ought. If we want to forgive others, please give us more faith. And Jesus' response is parable of a slave who serves his master. There is a parable of a slave who serves his master. And the master, and says that, you know, just because the slave, because the slave served the master, if the slave is thinking that master should thank me, master is not obligated to thank the slave. What does that mean? Simple thing is that, you know, we are serving, we are serving the Lord. And in serving the Lord, if we forgive somebody, that doesn't mean that if I am, I am doing something that was commanded to me, if I do that, if I expect a reward from God, or if I expect a reward from God, God, you must be impressed now because I did this. This parable says, master is not obliged, obligated to thank the slave. Just because I am obeying the master, that doesn't mean that master is obligated to thank me. There is another one more response. There is a living parable of 10 lepers who were healed. In the same chapter, you will see ten, there were 10 lepers who came and who were healed. But one of the leper returns to thank to Jesus and said, I want to thank Lord. So remember, it is always obligated for us to give thanks to the Lord. But God is never obligated to thank us for that just because we are obeying the commandment. 
Luke 18, 1 and 2, and with uh, this, we might close with this chapter probably. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and do not lose heart, saying, in a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. Now, there was a widow in the city and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. So this parable, we all know this parable. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Something that we need to chew a little into this. Unjust judge and the Lord. Unjust judge is unrighteous person. He's man, like unrighteous man, where Lord is a righteous person, all right? So unjust judge does not know this woman. This widow just came in. This woman just came in. He doesn't know this woman. But regarding Lord, he knows everybody. He knows completely. He knows everything of our life. Or anybody who comes in, Lord knows. There is a comparison between unjust judge and the Lord. This unjust judge does not care about this woman. He don't care what this woman was saying. He don't care. Woman came and asked for a legal protection. But this judge was not ready to hear him. But Lord cares for all creation. No matter who comes to him, he cares for them. And then unjust judge finally grants the needed help because of woman's continuing request. He grants because this woman was continuously coming and asking and, you know, bothering him. So he said, even though I don't know this person, even though I am an unrighteous judge, even though I don't fear God or even man, I don't care this woman, but just because of the botheration, I just gave what she want. Now the Lord says he will not be slow, but will quickly grant justice to the elect. Friends, through this parable, what Lord is teaching us, if an unjust judge who is in this world, who live in this world like unrighteous person, if this person can take care of this woman because of the botheration, because of continuous crying, how much more the Lord will do to one who cried day and night in his presence. I am encouraging everybody who is in prayer who is in fasting, who pray to Lord continuously before the Lord. I want to tell you, if an unjust judge can take care of a woman whom he have never seen or who, to whom he don't even care, how much more this Lord cares for you? How many of you believe that this Lord cares for me? This Lord cares for your family. This Lord cares for your health. This Lord cares for your life. This Lord cares for your spiritual life. Today, even when you are in tears, when you cannot tell your tears to anybody, you cannot show your tears to anybody, this Lord can read your tears. Do you believe this? He is a justice Lord. He is a just Lord. And can somebody believe today and say amen to this? Today, I just want to give a prophetic word to each one of you who are learning this word that if, a, if an unjust judge of this world can, can get to the place of giving the things that someone is asking continuously, Bible is very clear how much more the just Lord cares for those who cry to him day and night. So my dear brother, my dear sister, my dear friend, if you are continuously praying to Lord about something, if you're continuously praying today, I just want to encourage you keep doing it because your Lord is not unjust God. 
unjust judge don't even fear god don't even fear man but here there is a lord who love everybody who is a loving god with both of his hands he embraces you today and as i speak now somebody need to receive this by faith that he is going to bring justice for you you have gone through injustice but god is bringing justice to you justice is coming to you your prayers are going to be heard you will see the reward of your prayer you will see the benefits of your prayer you will see the deliverance of your prayer you will see healing in your body you will see the deliverance in your spiritual life you will see god's doing in your life this is happening right now as you receive the word of god because it is so powerful word of god is so powerful this is not the word of man this is not the word of any apostle this is the word of jesus christ he will never lie he never committed sin he never he was never found in sin in him there is no sin this word is yes to yes and no to no and this lord says i will bring justice to you i will not be slow if you feel like lord it's been long time i am been waiting from you such a long time lord says i will quickly grant justice to my elect you are my elect you are the one who are purchased by the blood of jesus christ so this lord will do that for you how many of you believe that and say amen right now i want you to take this word and apply this to your personal life to your family and to your christian life this lord is a just lord if enemy comes and say where is your lord how long you been praying this is the scenario was enemy is coming to cast a seed of doubt inside you today you need to say i believe in my just lord lord jesus christ who is a just god you know he is second person in trinity father son and holy spirit i believe in this god this is a just god he is going to bring justice to me if you have been going through injustice in your workplace if you are been going through injustice in your personal life in your professional life in your spiritual life you feel like no it was not just with me it was totally unjust injustice with me today i want to tell you believe in the lord and try to proclaim the justice of the lord in your life and lord is going to do that i truly believe lord is blessing you all today as you hear this word as you learn this word just commit yourself in the hands of god and say that lord i commit myself into the into your hands say that lord i am your child i am your child and i believe i am your elect i am purchased by the blood of jesus christ jesus christ how many of you are sure that you are purchased by the blood of jesus christ this bible study is not just to bring the things in your mind but it is also to apply in your body in your spirit and in your ministry today i want to tell you in your ministry this will be a doubt that will come it, uh, you know i am a victim of injustice let me tell you you cannot be a victim of injustice lord is going to bring justice to you Lord is a just God. How many of you will believe this and say amen to this?